What is a utopia? How does a society come together and become self-sufficient? Can such a thing be built? Or is it doomed to fail? Henry Ford thought he had it figured out, but as we'll learn, he was wrong. Hello and welcome to Past Gas Podcast Woo. by Donut Media. Woo. I am your host, James Pumphrey, yes, and are. as always, I am joined by your other host, Nolan J. Sykes. Hello. Thank you for listening so much. Um, let me introduce this. This is part one of our two-part series on Fordlandia, Henry Ford's utopian vision for a rubber plantation down in Brazil. It is one of the more bizarre things that we have encountered in our, you know, three years uh, digging through. Yeah. Uh, digging through automotive history here on Donut. Definitely. Um, in but, this, but also unsurprising no for henry ford. entirely unsurprising um oh, oh of course henry ford wanted to build a utopia in brazil of absolutely. course yeah Best ass podcast it's about cars it's not about ports um so in this episode we're gonna lay some background for henry ford himself and the weird guy that he was he ate grass mm -hmm. he what else did he do that was weird he he was a huge, not only did he eat grass, literal weeds that were outside of his house because he, he knew they were natural, but he was a huge proponent, early adopter of uh, soybean consumption. He loved soy, uh, believed it He's was- a soy boy? <laughs> technically. Henry Ford, the original soy yeah. boy. Uh, he thought it was like the answer to the world's hunger problems, which is partially true, but- Also terrible for the environment. Too that too, soy. not not great. Um, what else? He, as we'll find out, he was a just a little bit racist. He was uh, pretty fairly racist. Had some interesting ideas about the Jewish people. Uh, also invented the Model T. So yeah, invented and, the Model T and, and invented the um, assembly, line. assembly line. So, so to put it lightly, a complicated man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, if it weren't for Henry Ford, we'd still be making. Even like Pagani has an assembly line. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure we would have thought of it eventually. Uh, but... Yeah, you and me would have thought of it, oh, but yeah. the world would have been without it for about a hundred years. <laughs> I mean, once you and I get together, of course we're going to yeah, come up with that totally. great idea. I mean, it's basically an assembly line of content that we're pumping out here, right, guys? <laughs> yeah, it's only me and James. <laughs> <laughs> There's no team behind uh, us. I, I'm just kidding. Jk, we have we four have a people million in the room. Yeah, we have a million editors. We love them all. A lot of them have really a lot better facial hair than I do. That's for certain. Felipe, you have a mustache, yeah, and just a light kind of beard going on. Yeah, you look um, dangerous. Yeah, you look good, like dangerously good. All right, so enough. Um, enough I, flirting with the I, crew. I, <laughs> <laughs> sure, you, you're yeah. uh, implicating yourself. Maybe. Uh, let's just get into it. Let's get into part one of Fordlandia, yeah. aka Fordtopia. I think it's just, sure. That's what I call it. Okay. <laughs> it all started in 1925. Henry Ford was having lunch in his Dearborn, Michigan mansion with his good friend, business partner, and tire magnate, Harvey Firestone. Harvey and Ford had been friends and partners since Ford started building cars decades earlier. So yeah, just remember, like, he invented the Model T, which is the first, like, cheap car, and basically... He brought the car to the masses. Exactly. Uh, Mr. Firestone had begun ranting, this time primarily focused on the impending rubber cartel that had been proposed in England by one Winston Churchill. I am not a crook. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that famous yeah. Churchill quote? He's, like, yeah. sitting there with his cigar, and he's like, on this day, it, I am not a crook. <laughs> And it will live in infamy. <laughs> yep, that's him. The purpose of and he was also the was Churchill, the king. No. <laughs> <laughs> the purpose of the rubber cartel was to limit the export of rubber in order to not overextend national resources in case there was another world war. Nineteen twenty-five, probably a good idea, but Harvey Firestone. Didn't like that idea. He believed that rubber prices were going to spike in the U.S. as a result mm -hmm. and therefore negatively affect Firestone tires. No, some things never change. Mm -hmm. 
Harvey Firestone was not alone in this fear. Even presidential candidate FDR feared the effects of a rubber tariff. Rubber was viewed as the automotive industry's choke point, seen as even more crucial than oil. That's crazy. The automotive industry relied on vulcanized rubber for literally everything from tires to hoses and gaskets. A price increase of any kind could sink the young business. So there was a legitimate fear of Churchill's plan passing. Yeah, it seems somewhat reasonable. But somewhat also, reason it's, it's kind like, of a good idea. It's kind of like... Okay, here, newsflash, guys, if you're listening to this, this might lose some of you. Nolan and I believe in climate change. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it's sort of like, yeah, making some changes like, you know, not dumping tons of poisons into rivers and stuff might be more expensive for some people. But in the at the end of the day, it's good not to have poison rivers. And it's also probably good to have, like, rubber to defeat the Nazis. Yeah, Germany was totally destroyed. Mm-hmm. And they were afraid of something like All that happening. All of Europe happening. was. All of Europe, yeah. They were afraid of something like that happening again because those wounds had not been healed right. at all. And Churchill was just saying like, hey, fellas. Hello. How, is, how does he talk? Lincoln Churchill talks like this. <laughs> yeah, is this is how he talks. Okay. Mm. I like it. Listen, listen, fellas. The wounds of war are still fresh and salty. I say that maybe we just save some of our supplies in case a freight breaks out or two again. Blah, 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 blah. Hurrah, bully, bully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all he's saying. All he's saying is like, hey, guys, the whole world was just at war. I think it might happen again. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should just like chill and be ready. Mm -hmm. And these guys are like, but I'm making my money. <laughs> so Harvey Firestone was fed up with living in constant fear of this, so he decided the best course of action would be to grow his own rubber. Smart. This wasn't the first time he had some crazy idea. In fact, Harvey had tried to declare economic independence from the UK and fly rubber under the American flag a few years earlier. <laughs> but that was truly the ramblings of a madman who doesn't seem to understand that you can't just not claim another country's resources by saying, I want this cheaper, so I'm just going to say it's American now. Although, now that I think back on it, that's kind of how we did a lot of stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. <clears throat> but Harvey actually had a plan. He decided that he was going to start his own plantation in Liberia, where the conditions were almost perfect for growing rubber trees. By keeping the production in-house, he could avoid all the excess fees associated with importation from other countries. Henry Ford had also tried growing his own rubber a year earlier. In 1924, he had purchased large quantities of land in the Florida Everglades, only to eventually do nothing with them. It was cheaper for Ford to import the rubber. The idea of a dramatic price increase was still only speculation. But still, Harvey's plans had piqued Henry Ford's interests. And after the lunch meeting was over, he requested that his personal aide, Leobold, would find out where the best place to grow rubber is. Hey, Leopold, come over here, boy. Where is the best place to grow rubber? Uh, 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 <laughs> Go I'm... find out! Oh. <laughs> Liberia was the obvious choice. Harvey Firestone discovered it had the perfect climate when he put his plantation there. But unfortunately, Henry Ford was very, very, very racist. <laughs> and he would not dare step foot in such an uncivilized and African society. So they came to the conclusion that the rubber should be grown where it originated, in the Amazon. So rubber uh, comes from both vines and trees, and you okay. let it grow. Right. And then you, when you chop it, you squeeze the vines, mm -hmm. and latex, literal latex, comes out of the, the trees. Yeah, so it's a liquid, and then they put it out onto like big, flat, like drying areas. Uh -huh. Then when it dries, you can pull it up like a sheet of latex. What? And then... You take a bunch of that latex, yeah. stack into big bales, and then that's what gets shipped out to like vulcanization plants and stuff like that. So these plantations are really only concerned with growing the vines and extracting that latex from them. Okay. And Liberia had the perfect climate. But what about the Amazon? Amazon also very good climate. really great climate. Only problem, it's a lot harder to get into the rainforest than it is in Africa. Got you. Throughout the 19th century, the Amazon River Basin supplied all of the world's rubber and made up 40% of Brazil's exports at the height of the rubber boom in the second half of the 19th century. But the Amazon's rubber boom quickly turned to bust as plantations in Asia and England were able to grow rubber in much denser populations and much more efficiently. In the Amazon, many natural species that are not present in other countries limit the growth of trees. So by organizing plantations in other countries, the efficiency was greatly 
increased. Henry had another incentive to go to South America besides his racism. In Theodore Roosevelt's book, Through the Brazilian Wilderness, he accounts his experiences traveling through the Amazonian rainforests. One of his most significant observations is that many fast-flowing rivers could provide an almost perfect power source for any industry bold enough to be born there. He claimed that... The right kind of settlers, such as enterprising businessmen of foresight, coolness, and sagacity, who would be willing to put migrants to work for an advantage that would be mutually beneficial, would give rise to a great industrial civilization. Bully, bully. <laughs> uh, if anyone thought they could fill that descriptor, it was Henry Ford. Now, Henry Ford did not really make cars. Henry Ford thought that he made men. He's a maker of men. He's like me. Yes. He's yeah. a builder of men. The cars they produced were simply a byproduct of his training. He was praised as a sociologist manufacturer. If anyone could reshape the native Brazilians mm. into prosperous factory workers, it was Henry Ford. God, they don't want to be. Or so he thought. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want that. No. <laughs> Big thanks to Simply Safe for sponsoring this episode. Simply Safe home security is like getting commercial grade enterprise level security, but for your own home. Think about the security Fortune 500 companies use. I think about that stuff literally all the time. It keeps me up at night. How do I get in there? How do I get all their secrets? They need to know police are going to be on the scene immediately after I break in. This is exactly the kind of security you get with Simply Safe. You might say, my doors are safe, James, but what if a hamburglar tries to smash through my window and steal my stuff? That's a good point. You're a smart person. Hamburglars are cunning. Well, good news. Simply Safe has entry motion and glass break sensors inside as well as outdoor cameras and doorbell alerts to let you know someone's trying to steal your hard-earned hamburgers. If there's a break-in, Simply Safe uses real video evidence to give police an eyewitness account of the crime. And that means police dispatch up to 350% faster than for a normal burglar alarm. Go to simplysafe.com slash gas today to get free shipping on your order, plus a 60-day money-back guarantee. That's simplysafe.com slash gas to save on home security today. Support the companies that support Donut. Guys, we could not make these shows without these sponsors. We're not pocketing any of the money. We're paying for microphones and cameras and stuff. Holler. Hey, people. Nolan here. You know I love listening to music. But sometimes our office is super loud and I can't enjoy my tunes. And that's why I love my Raycon wireless earbuds. I truly love these things, guys. They, I wear them every single day. They're discreet, powerful, and they truly have great sound. And Raycon's latest model, the E25, is their best one yet with six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a more compact design that gives you a nice, noise isolating fit. Seriously, it cancels out so much noise from my coworkers. I forget that I'm not in my own private office. And for about half the price of other wireless earbuds, you can't go wrong. They automatically pair with whatever device I'm using, which is super convenient. But my favorite part has to be how long the battery lasts between charging. It seems like forever. And the case charges them up to three full times before you have to plug it in again. That's amazing. Now's the time to get the latest and greatest from Raycon. Get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com slash gas. That's buyraycon.com slash gas for 15% off Raycon wireless earbuds. Guys, seriously, get yourself some Raycons. They are incredible. After the Great Depression in the 1920s, Ford thought his village industry plan would solve all urban poverty. He once said, I believe that industry and agriculture are natural partners. <laughs> he was obsessed with powering his industry through natural means, specifically hydropower. Ford saw himself as a conservationalist of sorts. He had grown up on the family farm in Michigan and had learned to have an appreciation for nature. Henry Ford believed that a hydroelectric power would free industrial communities from the grip of energy trusts and that the future of industry would rely on building self-sufficient Little factories on the rivers. That's a quote. Mm -hmm. Little factories on the rivers. His dream was to achieve self-sufficiency 
for the industrial age. That's not bad. Not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea. No. I wish he could have done it. That's pretty cool. It was in Michigan's Upper Peninsula that Ford constructed a powerful hydroelectric plant that he paired with an absolutely massive sawmill. At Iron Mountain, sawmill workers would produce huge quantities of lumber for wooden automobile framework, floorboards, and even wheels. His purchase of Iron Mountain meant Ford had to do something that was a little outside of his wheelhouse. Wheelhouse! Hey, that's hey, a show. That's that a that show on YouTube. Ford had to manage a small town. As it turned out, Iron Mountain was home to 10,000 people who already lived there. Iron Mountain had everything from that giant sawmill and a processing plant to a five-story chemical laboratory. It was said that they used every part of the tree except the shade. Nice. I love that. Yeah. Iron Mountain was the epitome of a self-sustaining factory village Ford had dreamed of. Ford pushed for his vision of incorporating agriculture into factory life. Ford would offer low-interest mortgages so workers could buy land to build a home and farm, and then would pay high wages and provide access to machinery like tractors to allow the farmers to prosper. The dream was to bridge the divide between agriculture and industry and prove that he could build the perfect self-sufficient city and create his ideal America. He did not offer the standard city on a hill that was so popular in American mythology. Instead, Ford offered an alternative, a city in a valley, powered by hydroelectricity and even had its own food supply grown by Ford employees. And many people were intrigued. Now, about this time, Ford's famous $5 day strategy of employment was starting to not have the same impact it used to over his workers. In 1914, Ford started paying his employees five bucks a day for their labor, which was unheard of at the time. But, you know, naturally, inflation happens and living expenses had risen since then. So Henry changed his governing strategies in order to increase efficiency and the corporate dependency on his employees. He had two major methods of doing this. The first one was called the speed up. Basically, Ford would slowly increase the speed of the assembly lines until employees were forced to do nothing else but work for him. This titan of industry who once boasted on his pleasant working conditions was now nearly working his employees to death simply to ensure they could not leave to find new careers elsewhere. Sounds familiar, Matt. <laughs> The wife of one worker described the speed up as a method to turn factory workers into mere containers of labor, as Ford neglected the uniquely personal connections he had once so proudly boasted. It sounds like a cult, almost. Yeah, cults start out just being sick. Yeah. And like, we all got these jumpsuits, we all just like hanging out and dancing, maybe we we'll do some LSD, <laughs> we eat lots of fruit, everyone's really healthy, we exercise together, and then all of a sudden one guy's like, you know what, I'm God. And I get to f everybody's wife. <laughs> That's always when it goes south. Now, the second method of governing his factories came by the limitation of unions within his corporation. He hired his new right-hand man, Harry Bennett, who was no more than a thug in a suit. He was tasked with making connections with the Detroit Mafia in order to fight unionization in his factories. Bennett took a very totalitarian approach to management within the company, even once gathering all employees in a mandatory meeting to inform them that if there must be bloodshed to prevent any mention of the word union within these walls, then I'm afraid I will shed every last drop to make that happen. That's insane. Yeah, Harry Bennett, um, I remember reading that he carried a gun with him, a, yeah. a big revolver. And yeah, this guy did not have any business being in a factory. He had no management experience. He was literally just a, a the muscle, yeah. the muscle with a gun. And I think at some point, not in this story per se, but there was a riot at the factory mm -hmm. where Harry Bennett's men were like shooting Ford employees who were fighting what? back throwing rocks and all that kind of stuff. That's crazy. Because they, they went on strike. They had enough. They said, we can't do this anymore. And they people, people died, yeah. Wow. Ford's factory reconditioning, that's a, a light word for that, <laughs> yeah. was not widely known by the public at the time. But one thing that was almost unavoidable was his rampant anti-Semitism. Henry Ford actually purchased his own newspaper called the Dearborn Independent, for the sole purpose of spreading anti-Semitic propaganda. It's kind of funny that he purchased a newspaper, considering he was never a big fan of reading. In fact, years earlier, he had sued the Chicago Tribune for <laughs> implying that he was illiterate. According to Ford, he needed to maintain the white man's code, oh, which is God. a 
gross term. <laughs> it's really bad. In the early 1920s, a new phrase had been coined, and that phrase was Fordism. Henry Ford's success was grounded in the power of high wages to create prosperous, healthy working class communities with private profit dependent on continual expansion of consumer markets. Or as Ford clearly would state, the ideals of Fordism... Our buying class is our working class, and our working class must become our leisure class if our immense production is to be balanced by consumption. He believed that the fulfillment of this vision could result in a restoration of small-town American life. Which, I mean, back then, what would... <laughs> yeah, what does that want, mean? He wanted to make America great again. I guess, but like, I can't imagine what small-town American life... What small town American life he was imagining? Right. Like, I mean, there are cities, big cities back then, but like you look at old pictures of like New York and L.A. and like it's just like what the <laughs> yeah. what is there to do here? <laughs> yeah. Everything was a small town. Chicago yeah. was a small town. In his pursuit to become a self-sufficient automobile manufacturer, Henry Ford wanted to expand his ideals of village industry throughout the country. His massive three hundred and thirteen thousand acre factory, Village Iron Mountain, was proving to be incredibly successful, and he had proposed to Congress to purchase multiple large areas of land in the Appalachian River Valley. The poor people of that area had seen the magic transformation that had occurred in Iron Mountain and could not wait for Henry Ford to show up at their front door with a new life, just as promised. When Ford comes became a famous slogan in the area, and it demonstrated just how important Ford's presence really was in the area. Unfortunately for Ford, Congress saw this attempted purchase as the beginning of a monopoly and denied the deal. So he was forced to look outside of the country for his newest land claim. As we kind of mentioned earlier, the Amazon River Basin saw a huge economic collapse in 1910 after rubber plantations in Asia began to dominate the market in the rubber trade. But Ford believed that his presence alone would be enough to restore the area to its former glory. By 1925, Ford already held a monopoly on the Latin American car truck trade, so it wasn't too far-fetched for him to expand his industry there even further. Ford went public with his plan to industrialize the Amazon, and people went bananas. Despite his hatred for the Jewish people, Ford ironically was pronounced the Moses of the 20th century, who would turn the Amazon into the promised land. And he was also called the Jesus of industry by the inhabitants of Brazil. Ford's autobiography had just been translated into Portuguese and released in Brazil, and the people there were amazed by the wonders that he had achieved. They were like primed for him yeah, to show up. they were stoked. In 1925, he met with Brazilian consul de Lima to negotiate purchase of his own chunk of land. Ford saw the Amazon as a fresh start in a place uncorrupted by unions, politicians, Jewish people, <laughs> lawyers, militarists, and New York bankers. He believed in his dream of, a, that was a quote. Mm -hmm. That was a quote that he said. That was, yeah. He believed in his dream of a factory town that would help the native people of the Amazon. There would be schools, experiment stations. Don't like the sound of that. Canteens, stores. Amusement parks, cinemas, athletic sports, hospitals, etc., for the comfort and happiness of those who work on the plantation. He believed that the best way to run a business was to create a paradise where your workers would never have to leave your business to get what they needed. Sort of like the old company store adage, but without all the crippling debt to the company. This had me thinking about, was it uh, Playa del Mar or Vista? Uh, Playa Vista? Yeah, Playa Vista. Yeah, I live, uh, like, I don't live in Playa Vista, but I live around there. Around there. Like, that's where our, the grocery store we go to is. And it's 1,000% that. Because they got the big Google. But, yeah, that's where all the tech now. companies are. Yeah. And there, it's really weird sometimes because there's like, Google has a headquarters there, mm -hmm. and then all around it are just these giant apartment buildings mm -hmm. that are also malls mm -hmm. on, like, the first couple of floors. Yeah, and then there's, like, basketball courts and tennis courts and, like, a soccer field. I was driving over there, you know, this weekend, and I saw a game of basketball where every dude had a top knot. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that's what it is. It's like, you have everything here, so, yeah. like, you don't have to leave. I mean, it seemed... Why would you want Look, to leave? It's already weird enough living in LA because it feels like it takes forever to get out of here sometimes. Like if I want to go visit my parents, it'll take me two hours to get from the office in West LA to Santa Clarita. Yeah. Which I know this is very inside LA right now, but yeah. like that's, a, that's it's like 20 like miles. 20 miles takes yeah. me two hours. Yeah. 
It looks like the planet in Guardians of the Galaxy where Peter gets like captured mm-hmm. that first time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like a weird utopia. Yeah, it's very strange. Anyway, mm-hmm. so that's it's happening in Plymouth. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'd like to take a second to thank Valvoline for sponsoring this week's episode. We at Pass Gas love history. And one of the most impressive things about Valvoline is their long, rich history. They've been around for over 150 years making high quality motor oil. They actually filed the first patent for motor oil, which makes them the original motor oil by definition. They're the only motor oil with a dedicated engine lab where smart ass scientists run specialized engine tests and figure out all kinds of science stuff that makes your engine work good. Since 1866, they haven't stopped innovating and it shows. Valvoline is responsible for the first high mileage oil, the first racing oil, and the first synthetic oil blend. That's a lot of freaking firsts, guys. I've only had one first, and that's losing my virginity. All Valvoline oils exceed the industry standards to provide ultimate protection for every engine. That's why some of the best in the biz use it, like Racing Legend and my second best friend, Mario Andretti, and my other best friend, Chris Forsberg. They both use Valvoline. But the biggest reason I like Valvoline is because their headquarters are in Kentucky, which is where I'm freaking from, ladies and gents. So take it from the Kentucky Cobra. Valvoline is great motor oil. Valvoline, guys, support the companies that support Donut. We could not make any of this stuff without these people believing in us. I got a question for you guys. How often do you think about your socks? If you're like I used to be, not much. But I recently discovered socks that change the way I'll think about socks forever. They're called Bombas. I got a free pair of these when I went to the 4xFar festival. And at first I was like, why would they give me socks at a music festival? And then when I got home, I put those freaking socks on. And I was like, dang, I wish I would have taken more than one pair. Because these Johns are comfy AF. Probably one of the comfiest socks I've ever worn. They're made from super soft super natural cotton and every sock has arch support and a cushioned footbed. That padding is great for me when I'm on a long shoot and I'm standing all day waiting for Felipe and Eddie to get the freaking cameras and lights ready. Christina, why am I called to set at 8 a.m. if I'm not working till 11 a.m.? That's a conversation for later. I didn't mean to pull you guys into it. I digress. The best part about Bombas is when you buy a pair of them, they donate a pair to someone in need. And that's really admirable because socks are super important. In fact, they're the most requested item from homeless people. Buy your Bombas at bombas.com slash gas today and get 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash gas for 20% off. Bombas.com slash gas gas. I'm literally wearing Bombas right now. I know this is a podcast, but if I could take a picture and show it to you guys, I would. And I could. Holler. They got great colors. There was something surprising about Ford's plan. It was how much faith the people of Brazil had in Ford. A Brazilian politician had this to say in a letter sent to Ford about a previous visit to Brazil. When you were down here, did you notice a curious thing? The faith everyone has in Ford, the magic in that name, has penetrated into the hearts of the most humble. It has got into mine. They have faith in Ford. So have I. Thousands await his coming. He will come. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, there's a lot of Brazilian politicians who probably, like, aren't, don't necessarily have the people's best interest Mm -hmm. in mind, so. I wonder how much of that is true. Like, I wonder how much, like, the people who are actually going to be working here are excited and not just, like, the politician who's going to get a bunch of money when he brings Ford to Brazil. Yeah, I think I should uh, preface this by saying I don't have any... <laughs> I I know nothing <laughs> about Brazil. So if it's anything like uh, what I know about American politics... Yeah, it's like this guy doesn't really give a shit what the people think. Yeah. Regardless, that positive letter was about the last bit of convincing Ford needed to finally put his money where his mouth was. He sent University of Michigan botanist Carl D. LaRue 
to Brazil to find a good location for his rubber plantation and to report back any other remarkable findings along the way. One thing LaRue immediately noticed was just how sick people in the jungle were. About one person in every household was ill or dying from some sort of jungle illness, such as malaria or hookworm. Ow. LaRue also noticed that most of the current workers in the rubber fields were practically held as slaves to the company because of debt slavery. Also known as slavery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Frontline Amazon workers were uncared for and viewed as disposable. The real lords of the rubber trade were the heartless foreign-owned export houses in control of the fields, but that was fine. Ford insisted that he would not be enslaving them to the company. In fact, the opposite. I promise I will not enslave you. It, I promise I'll be the opposite of the slave owning. He promised a life of luxury on the plantation so amazing that workers would never be forced to stay, but would join of their own volition. In his current existing factory cities, he even established a credit union and factory commissaries that would provide employees with a wide array of high-quality products at low prices, often way below cost. Ford was insistent that he was not trying to <laughs> enslave people. I just want to be clear. I am not trying to make you guys slaves at all. Not even 1%, okay? Okay. I insist I'm not trying to enslave any of my employees, okay? You can take that to the bank. You can take that to the bank. <laughs> the credit union. The credit union that I own. <laughs> you can borrow as much money as you want from me, and you can't quit till you pay it back. In, okay, interesting wrinkle. Um, <laughs> but I'm not trying to enslave okay. anybody I mean, yeah, with debt. Yeah, no, that's not what I'm doing. That that's not what I'm doing. That's yeah, not what I'm doing. You said that a lot, so I believe you. I want to hear you say it. You are definitely not... Going to and you're definitely not trying to enslave. Yeah, I'm definitely not trying to. Ra oh, right. You're definitely not trying to enslave us. I'm not trying to enslave you. But if I'm just so good at it that it happens naturally without even trying, that's a different story. <laughs> In 1927, Ford unveiled the Model A to a commercial triumph. Ford immediately took control of 45 percent of the automotive market share with the new car. That's incredible. Things were at an all-time high for Ford. He had just finished the massive River Rouge factory in Dearborn, Michigan, the largest integrated factory in the entire world, and he was making more money than he knew what to do with. Nothing could really go wrong for him, except, James, for a lawsuit. Oh. In 1927, Ford's anti-Semitism finally caught up with him. His newspaper, the Dearborn Independent, had been focusing a majority of its anti-Jewish hate speech against one Aaron Sapiro, a lawyer and activist who helped organize farm cooperatives throughout the U.S. and Canada. Ford undoubtedly saw a competition for the affection of farmers in Sapiro, so he had the Dearborn Independent focused directly on him, attempting to link Sapiro to a fictitious Jewish conspiracy that linked American farms to Jewish money interests. When you publicly attack a lawyer... Chances are you're going to get sued. Yeah, not a good move. <laughs> For defamation, right? Of course, upon finding out about the lawsuit, Ford published an article claiming that the idea was, this is a quote. This is a quote again. This is a quote. Born in the fertile, fortune-seeking brain of a young Jew. Ford was absolutely insane, and people knew it, and people were excited to watch his legal battle as they knew there was no way that Ford could win. People were hoping for a repeat of the 1919 spectacle when Ford sued the Chicago Tribune for giving the impression that he was illiterate, a lawsuit which he lost. Hey, I can read. You guys are telling people that I can't read. I can read. On July 8th, 1927, Ford settled the lawsuit and issued a public apology. I deem it to be my duty as an honorable man to make amends for the wrong done to the Jews as fellow men and brothers by asking for their forgiveness. Consequently, the Dearborn Independent closed its doors forever. As a side note, you can still buy a transcript of all of Ford's anti-Semitic hate speech <laughs> on Amazon.com in his book, The International Jew. It is rated four out of five stars, and the biggest complaint is that the font is too small, so it is difficult to read. <laughs> <sighs> Complicated guy. Complicated guy. <laughs> That's um, some nearsighted racist. It's like, can you make it? Can you print it in a bigger it. font? 
I can't read this. <laughs> I want to read this so bad. This anti-Semitism is, I mean, I mean it's bad, but I, I, I can't read this. I wish that I could be an anti-Semite easy. <laughs> but I can't. I can't read it. Uh, I don't. I don't want to wear glasses because I, mean, <laughs> I don't want to wear glasses. Where are you going with this? People think I'm a nerd. Okay. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Incidentally, 1927 was a big year in terms of rubber importation, which was actually bad for Ford's plan. The proposed rubber cartel by Winston Churchill failed to get any other European countries on board, so it crumbled beneath him, causing the price of latex and rubber products to tumble uh, to values lower than its previous record in 1910. At this point, it did not make any fiscal sense for Ford to continue with opening a plantation in the Amazon, as importing rubber was not substantially cheaper. It was recommended that he just construct a purchasing office instead, but he decided he wasn't going to listen to any logic or reason and went ahead with the plans to build the plantation anyway, completely ignoring the supply and demand curve. Screw it! Screw it. Oh. Screw it. I'm doing it anyway. I'll see you in Brazil. <laughs> Ford put in an order to purchase the land recommended to him by LaRue and began seeking approval for the Brazilian plantation. At this point, it wasn't being built to save the company money or allowed Ford to be self-sufficient. Ford was going to live out his own heart of darkness fantasy by building an industrial Arcadia in the jungle. Ford purchased 2.5 million acres of land for $125,000. Wow. On September 30th, 1927, state legislators ratified the concession of land equal to about the size of the state of Connecticut. All in all, it took less than three months to get the entire purchase approved, proving to Ford that it was much easier to become a global powerhouse than just a national one. Yeah, just buy some land. Just and buy some land down in Brazil. People think you know dude. what you're doing, I guess. The Ford Motor Company has always been filled with rivalries, and of course, there were a fair share at the time. His son, Etzel, who was also an executive of Ford at the time, was imaginative and creative, and Ford hated that about him. Mm. Ford preferred Henry Bennett, and Henry Ford made it very clear who his favorites were. At times, he would intentionally dismantle Edsel's work behind his back just to make him angry, while Bennett received a constant stream of praise. What a dick. What a dick. Just like taking your kid's shit up. <laughs> it's messed up. Man. But now Bennett was needed back in Dearborn to rule the factories with an iron anti-union fist, so he was granted a protege. Oh, no. A man named Blakely was brought on and found himself immediately visiting a city about 100 miles away from the proposed site of Ford's Industrial City. He quickly gained a reputation among both his co-workers and among the city as a drunkard and exhibitionist. Oh, boy. His favorite pastime in Brazil was making love to his wife in full view of a taxi cab station so everyone could see. He was reckless and intense, just like Bennett, which was exactly why Ford loved him. Cool guy. Sounds like a cool guy. Yeah. Um, I mean, but this is like the stuff that we're talking about almost a hundred years later. Can you imagine all the other stuff that he did that were that oh, didn't last a hundred years? This guy, I mean, he was probably like doing that thing where he left his parking lights on or uh, hazard lights on to park where yeah. he wanted. He was probably giving people one star reviews on Uber, <laughs> even though they were totally fine. Yeah, he was. Uh, he. <laughs> Those are the only two dickish moves I can think of. Yeah, because uh, you're not a dick. You're yeah. a nice guy. After the land had been purchased, Henry Ford immediately placed Blakely in charge, despite unanimous disapproval of Blakely from everyone around him. Ford selected him to head the plantation. And in 1928, Blakely loaded up two large cargo ships with enough equipment and supplies to establish a small town. They had bought the ships used from a Great Lakes shipping company, as Henry Ford was a strong believer in recycling. So, Again, complicated, complicated guy. Yeah. <laughs> Among the ship was also a decently sized crew of Ford employees and other miscellaneous fellows, including the ex-sheriff of Kalamazoo. Yeah, every town needs a sheriff. Yeah. Well, I got fired from being the sheriff of Kalamazoo. I guess I'm going to go down to Brazil. <laughs> I hear that you can have sex with your wife in front of a taxi station. Ford's great endeavor was all coming together. He had made smaller versions of his plan work in the States, but now he was going to try to build a city that housed 25,000 employees and another 
100,000 residents that could be self-sufficient. The New York Times had estimated that the plant would be capable of producing upwards of 6 billion pounds of rubber per year, enough to make 1 billion Ford tires. Mm. That's a lot of cars. It's a lot of cars. Once they arrived, they decided they would settle in a small city named Boa Vista. They were greeted by a, a few small huts, but decided they would deal with the squatters after they had established the plantation. Never mind that those squatters were really the 10,000 people that already lived there. It's kind of like Iron Mountain, although they're probably kinder to the Iron Mountain people than yeah. these people. The Ford crew immediately found a problem, though. The two merchant ships they arrived in, the Farge and Ormoc, really cool name, yeah. uh, were nearly 250 feet long and 50 feet across, much larger than the shallow canals could allow. And worst of all, they arrived during the dry season. Fucking idiots. <laughs> The Amazon River Basin sees anywhere between 60 to 100 inches of rainfall each year, a majority of which is during the rainy season. But Blakely had not only mistimed their arrival with the weather, but he also managed to arrive during a severe drought. So water levels were at an all-time low. Basically, the two ships and their crew and their 38 Hundred tons of equipment were stranded just outside the entrance to Ford's planned paradise. The ships had to be unloaded onto smaller ships just to reach Boa Vista, which took weeks. Ugh. And this caused the crew to get restless. Every day, there were nasty accidents and small scuffles on deck. On the final day of unloading their cargo, one crew member known as Sailor Stadish <laughs> uh, was on deck of the Ormac while teasing Fireman Patrick. <laughs> 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 Apparently, Stadish opened his mouth when he wasn't meant to, and the next thing he knew, Fireman Patrick was charging at him with an iron bar. When Stadish took a step back to dodge the attack, he fell into an open hatch above the cargo hold, falling about 25 feet and fracturing his skull. Ugh. And that would not be the last major injury that would happen in the pursuit of Fordlandia. Mm -mm. The ships had arrived to bring, quote, redemption to the Amazon, yet... It had taken almost until the end of January for them to finally unload. They had been there for three months, and they were finally off their freaking ships. But that was the least of their worries. It wasn't until they finally unloaded that trouble really began. And that's what we'll pick up Ooh. next week on part two of Fordlandia, when Henry Ford went to Brazil to try and start a utopia and failed. Yep. So, again... Obviously horrible person. What a weird... <laughs> but just everybody. Yeah. I know, like that... Like, just like businessmen like this, like huge titans of industry, are just dicks. Mm -hmm. And, like, because you don't become a titan of industry unless you're a dick. Like, he was making plenty of money. He was printing money. Mm -hmm. He had, like... 45% of the entire automobile industry. I know. Why do you need more? You just kind of got to keep eating, I guess. And then sending the Blakely guy down there. Like, okay. Yeah. Imagine Matt tells you to go to the Amazon to start Donut Brazil mm -hmm. as the satellite office. Yeah. And he's just like, all right, James, get a team, go down there. And you're just like, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think he'd be like, why do you want to go down so bad? <laughs> like, because I'm going to. I'm going to get in fights. <laughs> um, it's just, again, hubris playing that role. And just, just like, yeah, just feeling like you have the right to everything. You know, like, we'll deal with these guys. It's like you literally traveled across the world to kick these people out of where they live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they're dicks. Yeah, they're dicks. Basically. All and right. We'll, uh, we'll learn just how big of dicks they are next week. Mm -hmm. uh, again, thank you guys so much for listening to this podcast uh thanks to everyone who left a review yeah thank you um we really love reading them follow nolan on instagram yep. at nolan j sykes and twitter thank follow you. me on instagram and twitter at james pumphrey follow donut at donut media check out our youtube uh, we got some really really exciting stuff coming up mm -hmm. um until next time i love you be nice Let's cast on this pod. Let's pod on this cast. Let's talk about cars. It's past gas. Whoa. <laughs> we are gonna pod on this cast. Everybody get some of your past gas. 